so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, research that I did for my PhD when I was at Dartmouth before I came here. It was studying the effects of sulfuric acid on the mechanical properties and microstructural evolution of polycrystalline ice as it would apply to ice sheets and glaciers. And what I'm going to throw out to you today are some ideas that I have sort of at the end of the talk of how this applies to our world, our um, you know, snow, avalanche, forecasting, or uh, prediction, safety, how this can potentially apply to that world too. I've got some ideas for it. I'm going to throw them out, I'm going to throw them out there to you later and we can talk about it. But before I get into that, I'd first like to talk about Japan. <laughs> so, as some of you might have seen in one of Doug's earlier emails, I just recently got back from a trip to Japan. It was my first time there. I spent a couple weeks there. And it was, uh, I was lucky enough to get an award from the university. It's called a Faculty Excellence Grant. So I traveled to Japan to meet up with other scientists and visit the laboratories, kind of see what they do, trying to build a collaborative type relationship. And it was a great trip. Nothing but good things to say about Japan in case you've never been. The first place I went to, just to orient you, this is Tokyo right here. The first place I went to is the Snow and Ice Research Center, and I visited the Cryosphere Environmental Simulator in Shinjo, Japan. Uh, next, I went to the Nakaya Museum of Snow and Ice. I'll talk about each one of these individually here in a second. Then uh, to the Nozawa Onsen Ski Resort, because you have to do a little bit of skiing if you're going to go to Japan in the winter. Uh, then to the Forestry Research Institute in Tokomichi, and then finally to the Snow Avalanche and Landslide Research Center in Yoko, Japan. Did you guys, have you guys ever even heard of these? facilities in these laboratories. The history there is what I was really soaking up more so than anything else while I was there. So this is me at one of the original uh, Snow and Ice Research Centers in Shinjo. You know, with this pair of skis, it's uh, at least 150 years old that they were using back then just to get out because Japan gets tons and tons of snow. So they've been dealing with it for a really long time. So this is a view of the Cryosphere Environmental Simulator. It's kind of James Bondish, if you will, in the sense that it's huge. This huge facility just for studying um, snow avalanche release and uh, wind effects on snow. So this is actually a table that they cover with snow. They have a snowmaker up here in the ceiling. They can put down a snow slab that's uh, three meters by five meters in area on this table. It's huge, and then they can tip that table up to 45 degrees and put wind on it and do different things with it to study kind of snow slabs. And they use that for avalanche studies as well as kind of just uh, the benefit for different cities in Japan as well. And then this thing right here, this is a view of the inside. This is a wind tunnel that actually loops around. And so they're able to study wind effects on snow uh, probably better than anyone else in the world that I know of right now too. So this is uh, some instruments they've got inside the wind tunnel. And this instrument package moves the next Y and Z through this tunnel, the wind tunnel. Uh, next, went, I went to the Nakaya Museum of Snow and Ice. Nakaya started doing work on snow probably before anyone else back in the 20s and 30s, actually. And if you're familiar with that name, Nakaya, it's probably because you've seen this once or twice in your career. Mm -hmm. He was the one who produced this, what was called the Nakaya Curve, of how temperature and supersaturation in the atmosphere relates to the different types of ice particles we get. There's an entire museum that you can go check out dedicated to him and his work. Highly recommend it if you're ever over there for a ski trip. It's worth the worth the journey to visit this museum. Next to the Nozawa Onsen Ski Resort, we just missed Japal season. So we were there for more just slush, is what we call it. <laughs> it was like a quick shift from PAL to, to spring skiing. So the skiing wasn't all that great, but it was interesting to visit another resort in another country like this. This is the Nozawa Onsen uh, Ski Resort. I think the ski jump in the Olympics was held here. And notice all these red areas. Those are all treat areas that are closed to Skiing traffic. So here's one way to, to deal with your, your hazards as a, as a mitigator at a ski area. If you don't want to deal with people in the trees or, or triggering small slides, just close it. You know, don't worry about it. It's kind of their approach. But there's also some really great hiking terrain off the, the ridges from the top of the resort. And, and what they have here, they have an open boundary policy, but you have to fill out a, um, a, a checklist of sorts, you know, like a, a backcountry ski plan with their ski patrol before you head out. That's like, how many people in your group? What's your level of training? Who's the group leader? How much gear do you have? How long are you going to be out? Where are you going? Like, you have to submit a plan like that to the ski patrol. And even then, if you go out and get caught in an avalanche, it's all on you. You know, they'll eventually come and get you, but you're going to pay for things and um, be responsible for your own rescue for the most part. So it, it's another, it's a different approach. I, I guess than what I'm used to. And also, they're really big on not using explosives, but just building structures to help mitigate um, avalanches. So this is a big snow fence that was built to catch avalanches coming out of this gully. As you can see, it's quite tall. You know, there's some a skier standing next to it. 
so pretty beefy uh, installation. Next off to the Snow Avalanche Landslide Research Center. Uh, again, they use lots of large structures to deal with areas that we might control by explosives. So these are six meter tall snow fences are catching this uh, embankment here. Uh, this is the, the, the research center. And what struck me is one of the things they're really interested in, I don't know how well you can see this plot, but um, compared to the Columbia Mountains in Canada, the Alps in Switzerland, where most weak layers are due to, or avalanches are due to depth or faceted crystal surface or they don't have those kinds of problems there. What they really have are storm snow instability. So most of their uh, avalanche incidents are related to what they think is the particle type. So how much rime was on a particle when it fell, basically, versus how you know, just clean and dendritic was it. That's what they're seeing as correlated to when they have large cycles. So that's what they're trying to catch um, information for in real time to be able to predict avalanches better in Japan, which is totally different from here, which is something I never realized until you go over there and, and talk to these people. So that was really insightful for me. The last place and probably the most impressive was this Forestry Research Institute in Tokamichi. Tokamichi gets more snow than anywhere else in Japan. They're interested in snow avalanches for forestry because avalanches take down trees and they need trees uh, for building resources and, and whatnot. So they've been studying avalanches and snow at this site literally for the last 100 years. And this tunnel is the tunnel that goes underneath the ground right here, out to the edge of, there's a big steep snow slope right here on the edge of the, the lawn. And they were, 80 years ago, they put in this tunnel so that they could go out to the edge of the, the tunnel, put some sort, of, um, um, some sort of measurement device into the snow and measure glide in the snowpack on the hill. And then they would plant different types of tree covers on the hill to see how that affected the rates of glide that they were getting because you know, wet avalanches, glide avalanches are a big deal. So this tunnel uh, was, I don't know, it, it was really interesting to see. It's 80 years old that, they were, that the Japanese were studying snow glide. And to kind of reiterate that point, at this same site since 1918, these snow stakes that you see in the ground here is the max snow height each year since 1918, 100 years of data. And what that looks like is summarized here. So this is 1917, uh, 1918 winter. Every 10 days, they go out and dig a snow pit, do a profile, and document the, the snow that they see. Um, and so this is showing on the left uh, snow depth, and then time on the x-axis going from uh, 1917, 1918, all the way up to the, the current winter. So you can see what 100 years of data collection looks like. So just a pretty fantastic, um, kind of mind-blowing data set when you think about it. And this was just something they handed to us on our way out the door of, by the way, this is something that we've been doing here for a really long time. Maybe you, should, maybe you want to check it out. And, and since I've come back, I really want to learn Japanese because I think there's probably a lot of interesting publications um, out there that are only in Japanese. And so maybe if we really want to dig into past literature, that'd be one way to do it. Anyways, back in Bozeman, again, if you saw Doug's email, uh, I did just recently have a baby, so she was hanging out, and it was really hard to be away from her. Her name's Mesa, but we just got her a ski pass, so she was having a good time. She, she was okay. You know, she, was, she was shredding the Bridger Bowl every day while I was gone. I thought it was cool because I was in Japan. All right, so I can talk about Japan for the rest of the time, but that's probably enough. Um, moving back to the research I want to talk about today, the effects of sulfuric acid on polycrystalline ice. So. For those of you that don't know, sulfuric acid is naturally produced in the Earth's atmosphere. It's the byproduct of sulfur dioxide mixing with some other things. You get sulfuric acid. It comes from biomass burning, volcanic eruption, so on and so forth. It's been going on for millennia here on Earth. And so sulfuric acid is naturally produced in all of our rainwater, all of our snowflakes, everything that's being deposited onto the surface of the Earth. But very few people have studied what that means for uh, the mechanical properties of ice. So this is kind of what people are looking at now for ice sheet and glacier um, deformation studies, how this is being affected by climate change, and so forth. So the objective behind this study was all laboratory-based, was to make samples of polycrystalline ice. Uh, polycrystalline meaning that there's um, random orientation of grains in either one of these samples, even though it looks pretty crystal clear. Ed will appreciate that. I have props. So this is what one of these samples look like in real scale that we were making of polycrystalline ice. And if you looked at its microstructure, you know, you can see that it's uh, polycrystalline. So anyways, we were making these so that we could compress them and pull them in tension 
and doping them with very small amounts like uh, 10 parts per million sulfuric acid in one of these snow samples to be representative to nature. It's very, very trace amounts of sulfuric acid that's in uh, natural rainwater and snow. So we're trying to mimic that, make ice, then doing these mechanical tests to see how it affected the, the strength and the mechanical properties. To do that, we were using a NTS unit in uniaxial compression. So this is what uh, one of these cylindrical ice specimens looked like when you compressed it to 5% in strain. This was a really fast compression test, like over uh, less than an hour time period. And you see that you got lots of cracks happening uh, until it was pretty much cracked all the way through, but you could still take this thing out and hold it. It still had its structural integrity to it, which is pretty impressive when you think about it was compressed 5% in less than an hour. On the other hand, uh, we wanted to study creep behavior, so we made these dog bone shaped specimens and we put really low loads on these guys and these would have, you know, on the left here was a doped, sulfuric acid doped and a non-sulfuric acid doped specimen. And we put just a really light load, like 30 pounds or something on one of these things of ice and we'd leave it sit, we'd let it sit in the cold room for weeks, you know, literally two months sometimes coming back and seeing how it, how it was able to viscously flow, so no cracks this time, you know, just viscously pull and flow, like we all know that ice and snow does. Uh, after the test, we did a microstructural characterization of each of the samples. So for the compression specimens, we did uh, micro CTs, we used SCM, we did cross-polarized light imaging. I'll show you the results from some of these uh, different characterization techniques. Then for the tension-tested specimen. So here's what a piece of ice looks like after it's been literally stretched to 40% strain, you know. Uh, this probably took somewhere around six or seven weeks to get to that, that point. We did the same thing. We did uh, cross polarized light imaging, SCM, and then also Raman spectroscopy, which I'll talk about a little bit later on these samples to try and see, you know, what the effects of uh, sulfuric acid was on the microstructural uh, evolution. So just jump into the results. So these are just gonna be sort of your standard engineering stress strain type um, plots I'm gonna show you. So if you look at each color, each color here is uh, linked to a different strain rate that was applied to the cylindrical specimen in compression. So this one times 10 to the minus four, that's that less than an hour, really fast compression to 5% strain. This one times 10 to the minus six per second is more like uh, 13 hours to get to 5% strain. So just a really s much slower rate of compression. And so that was the blue down here, the really slow one, and the really fast one up here. And so what you see is as you first start to compress one of these uh, cylinders like this, you see a resistance to uh, the, the, the strain being imparted to the sample, and then it starts to give. And the higher up you go, you get what's called the uh, peak stress, and maybe out here you call it a flow stress. For once, it's just kind of that curve flattens out. Uh, but what's interesting here is that you see so the solid line is the um, undoped sample, and the dashed line is the doped sample for each of these strain rates. And this is just a spectrum of strain rates in between one hour and 13 hours, basically. You always see that there's a decrease in the strength of the ice whenever it has this little bit of sulfuric acid in there. And it's, and it's pretty uh, obvious at all strain rates until you start getting down to the really low, low strain rates where you know, there's a shift in the mechanism. I don't want to get too much into that, but I think it's fairly obvious. Look at this plot, you know, bottom line. Sulfuric acid, even these trace amounts, has an effect on the mechanical property and the strength of the ice, which I thought was really uh, pretty interesting and pretty cool. It also had an effect on what the microstructure looked like. So if we look at these ice grains in the dope sample versus the undoped sample, the grains tended to be much larger. So that was affecting how they, they grew over time. And it also affected the number of cracks that we saw nice. So this is a micro CT video of uh, one of the samples that had been strained at a high strain rate. And the, the black is the cracks in the ice. The clear is the, just the ice itself. So we're able to quantify you know, by volume ratio how much air was in the ice that we would link to cracks that had, that had happened. And of course, we link all these cracks back to happening at the grain boundaries where each one of those colored grains meet each other. So that when we plot that up, what we found was that the sulfuric acid doped ice started cracking sooner. So the sulfuric acid doped ice is the, the black line. The undoped ice is the orange line. The sulfuric, and we're moving up to faster strain rates here. And then we have the volume fraction or, or more or less the number of cracks on this axis. So what we saw is that the sulfuric acid doped ice not only had more cracks in it, but started to crack sooner than the undoped. 
window of dice. And this is happening at the, the grain boundaries, presumably. And you can see that in the micro CT images here, too. So there's obviously more cracks in this sample than there were in this sample comparing the sulfuric acid dope dice to the undoped ice. So that was also pretty interesting. So there's lots of, I feel like, different things that were happening here depending on the type of deformation that was being experienced. And uh, we continue to look at that with the creep test. So the results from the creep tests. Again, this is the pulling and tension on this type of specimen, was that the sulfuric acid doped ice tended to creep what you might say is faster uh, than the undoped ice. And it's really clear. It just pops right out when you, when you plot this stuff up. And notice the duration that we're looking at down here is in days. So these tests all went, this is a pretty high temperature. So these tests all went to about 12 days. Um, and we were taking them to strains of around 20 or 25 percent. So this happened, I said, in a short, relatively short amount of time, 12 days at a high temperature. So the thing that makes creep really interesting to study when you're talking about something like ice is that creep rates and that slow deformation is really, I want you guys to remember this, time and temperature dependent. So if you give something, if you put just a light load on something and give it uh, a high temperature, high temperature being near its melting point. So in our world, ice and snow is always near its melting point. The steel beams in this building are nowhere near their melting point, right? So you wouldn't expect something like creep to be an issue uh, for steel, but for ice in our world, it, it's a big issue. So it, so it viscously flows, it creeps. Uh, and it's time and temperature dependent. So these were relatively fast tests, only 12 days long, because we we're at a really high temperature, minus six C. We look at the microstructure here, completely different. So this is at around 10% strain for a sulfuric acid doped piece of ice and a non-doped piece of ice. What we saw is these cranes grew to be much, much larger uh, than these by like a factor of two or three. Uh, and so that is going to link us back to the type of deformation that was happening, the mechanism by which this, these, uh, you know, the molecules are rearranging themselves more or less in the solid is, is related to what you're seeing here in the different sizes of the grain. This is, again, I'm just going to stress this, like 10 parts per million sulfuric acid that we put in here, so not very much, uh, has dramatic effect. Uh, the last bit and probably the most exciting bit from this research was the results from our Raman spectroscopy data. So Raman spectroscopy is essentially, you can do this with any kind of um, material really, but you shoot a laser at something, um, that laser excites whatever kind of element it's, it's hitting, it starts to vibrate, and then you measure you know, how much energy is lost due to that vibration of the material, and, and that difference between what's lost and what you receive back for the laser that you hit it with tells you about what you just saw. So, um, for instance, and, you know, for, for us, we're looking at oxygen atoms and hydrogen atoms and how they're bonded together. There's a certain frequency that that hits uh, that will tell you that that is H2O, you know, or tell you that it's you know, silicon and germanium for, say, semiconductor applications or you know, anything else you can think of. So on the right here, I'm showing what it looks like for just pure H2O, you know, water. There's a peak here for ice, and there's a peak over here for water. So you get and this is due to the, the oxygen and hydrogens being bonded together and how they're stretching, you know, how much freedom of movement that they have. So you have a really obvious peak from uh, the Raman for solid versus uh, liquid. And then over here, you don't see anything. This is a flat line I'm showing on purpose because if there was a sulfate uh, molecule there, an SO4, you would have a peak right here. And obviously there's not because we didn't add anything to this sample. But this is a tool that we can, you know, relatively quickly used to characterize where the sulfuric acid is in ice and maybe even how much of it is there. So applying this to uh, some of our ice samples, looking at these little triple junctions in the ice, these, these colored circles correspond to the, the colors shown here on the plot. This peak shows us SO4, okay, so there's sulfate, uh, which must be bonded to the hydrogen, so you've got the sulfuric acid present at these locations. And then you have primarily solid, but you have some input, some uh, differential input here actually from a liquid state. So what I'm going towards is asking this question, you pick up a piece of solid ice, you go to Highlight Canyon, you pick up a piece of solid ice. Is there liquid in that? What would you say? Yes. Yeah. No. You would have said that before I told you this? Because <laughs> I wouldn't have. I, would, I wouldn't have thought that there's liquid inside a solid piece of ice, right? Uh, even in these small amounts. And what we saw from a, another uh, sample was that we were able to see, again, we have the sulfate peaks here, but we actually did see a liquid peak uh, sometimes. That this is at a grain boundary in between the two pieces of ice. So what this means is that what you're really dealing with is this molten system. You know, it's not just solid. 
uh, ice that you're dealing with, you have you know, potentially some liquid in there. And this is all related to you know, the phase diagram of how <coughs> sulfuric acid is in water. And then when you apply it to ice, it comes out that you should expect to see if you get high enough concentrations of sulfuric acid that you get an aqueous solution. And that's what we saw here, which I think is uh, really pretty incredible uh, considering its effects on the creep behavior of the ice. So it's due to a number of different things of how you get that concentration there, but it's very obvious in the Raman spectroscopy data that it exists. So to kind of conclude, what did we learn from this study? Uh, just this little bit of sulfuric acid like comes from natural rainwater and snow, decreases the viscosity of natural ice, it increases the mean grain diameter of the ice, I think we saw that. It includes an earlier, uh, induces an earlier onset of micro-cracking at the grain boundaries. That was pretty clear. And it becomes concentrated at the grain boundaries in triple junctions such that a liquid-like phase exists in those regions. We were able to show that with the Raman spectroscopy. Okay, so I know what you're thinking right now is what's the point? <laughs> right? So, so what are we talking about? Why does any of this matter to the people in this room? And this, is, this is where I'd kind of like to somewhat go off script a little bit and just sort of start spewing out my ideas. So none of this that I'm going to talk about now has research to really back it up, but I feel like that's what we're here for, is to have a conversation. So the first thing I think about is, um, you know, weak layers and fracture propagation in a snowpack. What has to happen for that fracture to propagate? You're getting bonds breaking, you know, between ice crystals or, you know, the bonds between ice grains are, they have to break. You know, that's the way you get the mechanical failure. And this is what, this is a, a microscope image of um, how a bond changes over time between two ice spheres. You know, it goes from being fairly thin to fairly thick over time. This is from uh, some work by a colleague, Chin Baker. Here's another image. This is a scanning electron microscope image of the same sort of thing. And what you see is that there's actually a number of different fingers that come down from one grain to another as these two ice spheres are bonding together. So this is what you need to break for, you know, fracture to really happen in for avalanche release. And another way to look at that, maybe more clearly in a schematic sort of fashion, is that you might start with the grain boundary formation here between these two, let's call these snow grains, uh, and how that, that boundary can actually move over time. It's not stationary. And one of the things I really feel like I say a lot in any of these talks I give about um, ice and snow is that snow is, uh, number one, it's just ice with a lot of air in it. So if you can understand the mechanics and the physics of ice, then you understand something about snow as well. It just gets to be more complicated, in my opinion. Um, but also, it's a very dynamic material. It's always changing. I don't care uh, if you think 20 below zero is cold and that means it's all frozen up. That is still extremely close to the melting point of ice and snow. It is still changing. And so what I'm, how I'm thinking about this and applying it back to the other work is, is this uh, you know, viscous stretching of, of ice. One of the things that we saw with the plot that I showed of of the creep behavior is that it starts off really slow, the strain starts off really slow, and then accelerates up. And part of that accelerating up is due to the uh, cross-sectional area of this part of the ice that's stretching. As it gets smaller, there's a higher stress that's imparted to that, to that zone. It starts going faster and faster and faster the more you stretch it, essentially, right? So what I was thinking was, uh, one, we have sulfuric acid in our snowpack, whether you like that or not. So it really is all about the acid in some, to some degree. Uh, and it could be having the same effects on our snow grains, because they're ice, as it's having on our polycrystalline ice samples. And what's happening in a place like this, as it's stretching? Could the stress be going up over time? I think so. I mean, I think looking back at what we learned here, decreases the viscosity, uh, induces an earlier set of microcracking, becomes concentrated at grain boundaries and triple junctions to get like a liquid kind of film that could exist there in uh, natural snow. It makes me think about what about the time and temperature dependency for snow stability? I was here in 2011 when I was working at Yellowstone National Park. I came to this um, workshop that Doug put on and I think the topic of that time was um, surprise and post-control avalanche release. Remember that, Doug? Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of good talks about that, and that kind of stuff really stuck with me, and it stuck with me all the way through my career so far as what is happening there? Why is it we get caught off guard sometimes by really large and sometimes catastrophic avalanche events that we really can't explain? We can't just trace it back to, oh, there's a weak layer, it was obvious. You know, sometimes 
weak layers that were dormant become active again. And I really am of the mindset at this point that it is strongly related to this time and temperature dependency. You know, snow on a slope is always under you know, the effects of gravity. There's always a load being put on it. There's a stress that's always there. It's always near its melting point because we're on Earth, right? On planet Earth. And so the, this opportunity for creep to happen is always there. And so maybe things really do dramatically change from one day to the next uh, that we're not really able to perceive in any standard field metric that we have right now. So that's one thing. Uh, how do individual snow grains creep? You know, how much are these things kind of able to stretch and pull and kind of shrink down that area of contact to where there's, it takes less force to, to break that bond between the grains? And what does this mean for failure at grain boundaries? I mean, the polycrystalline ice video I showed uh, a lot of micro cracking happening at the grain boundaries between all those. I mean, that would be the least, the most energetically favorable place for an avalanche um, crack to propagate is going to be along all those grain boundaries. It's really easy to pull two different pieces of ice together than it is to pull one piece of ice apart right in the middle, right? So what does it mean for grain boundaries? So those are my thoughts. I'd love to hear your thoughts and maybe your experience on uh, looking at this in the field. Uh, leave you with um, some references. I'd like to acknowledge my advisor from Dartmouth, Ian Baker, that he was the one that helped me and worked with me on all the sulfuric acid ice research that I did. I'd be happy to take any questions about um, Japan or, <laughs> or sulfuric acid in ice. Any other acid questions that you have will be directed towards Doug. <laughs>